talk about is I want to start with, um, I, w I want to do two different things. On the one hand, I want to give you some motivation for studying Euclidean coxative groups. And that's what I will spend the first five or 10 minutes doing. And then um, the rest of the time, I want to give you concrete details about the specific Euclidean coxative groups. And so the first thing is just general motivation. Euclidean coxative groups come from and why are they important? Okay, because as you saw last time, as you saw yesterday, when we looked at the notation that is used for the spherical coxative groups, we looked at the notation used for the regular polytopes, and we looked at the notation for the Euclidean coxative groups, you could see that the Euclidean coxative groups were studied first. That's where the names make sense. That's where we had A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Right? They were studied before the polytopes. And so the question is why? And the answer is Lie groups. And so what I want to do is I want to give you just a very, so the, the subject of Lie groups is a, is a big, complicated subject. And um, we can easily spend all 15 hours on Lie groups. And so I don't want to give you lots of detail, but I want to give you just a little bit of detail about why Euclidean coxeter groups are important for Lie groups. OK? So um, yesterday, you saw the definition of a Lie group. It's basically a group that's also a manifold. Right? It's a group that locally looks like Euclidean space. And you should, you should think of just the unit circle or something slightly more complicated than that. Symmetry groups of spheres. Um, the notion of a Lie group has been around, so from Sophus Lie, who was a Swedish mathematician, Norwegian, Swedish, Norwegian. Does anybody remember? He's either from Sweden or from Norway. I can't remember which. Scandinavian, the Scandinavian mathematician, <laughs> selflessly, from the 1860s, defined this idea of a continuous group. Okay? And one thing that's sort of interesting about that is the discrete groups, the kind that we've been studying for most of the, most of the course. Discrete groups were not really studied. Um, they were studied a little bit by Galois in the 1820s, 18 teens, but Groups in the abstract, the abstract notion of groups was not until the 1870s and 80s. And so Lie groups actually came before discrete groups. Continuous groups came before discrete groups. And once he had this idea about studying um, continuous groups that are now called Lie groups, um, he decided to try and classify them. And so as he started to think about how to classify them, how are you going to try and classify big, complicated groups with a continuum of elements, with as many elements as the reals? And so one thing that he did was, like in the case of a circle, um, if you think about there being an identity element, because the multiplication is supposed to be continuous, what does that mean? Because the multiplication is continuous, if I take two elements that are very close to the identity, and I multiply them, where am I going to end up? Somewhere, Somewhere close to the identity. Right? That multiplying two things close to the identity is close to the identity because of continuity. Right? And in fact, um, let me give a, a more complicated example. Let's, let's imagine this isn't a lead group, but let's, let's imagine that we're doing something like, let's say this is S3. Okay, so one dimension more that I can draw. Let's imagine this is S3. Um, S3 is also a Lie group. Okay? Um, I won't tell you what the multiplication is, but it has one. Um, if you've ever studied the quaternions, in the same way that the unit complex numbers form a Lie group, the unit quaternions form a Lie group. Okay? Because they have a nice 
associated with multiplication. <coughs> and so if you start at the identity, you just pick some point, you call out the identity, and you take two points that are very close, and now you try multiplying them, you'll be something very close. Right? And in fact, the, the motions, when you multiply by an element on S3, it's actually going to be a nice rigid motion. And so it's like you're, you're taking it, and you're going to slightly rotate it this way, and you're going to slightly rotate it that way. And so when you do one followed by the other, then you're going to get some point that's going to end up, say, there. OK? But in order to make it a little bit more interesting, given two elements, you can try the commutator of g and h. You can multiply um, g, h, g inverse, h inverse. You can, try multiplying, you can try multiplying by g, multiplying by h, undoing g, undoing h. And if this was an abelian group, you actually end up back at the identity. Right? And so this is going to measure the failure of, a, of being abelian. It's going to measure the non-commutativity. Right? But then here's the, here's the sort of secret. So if you've got some element um, so you've got some element G and you've got some element H, which I want to think of. Um, why am I labeling this point G? Well, what I want to think of is that there is a unique group element, like here. If I said uh, the group elements in this picture, the group elements are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the points. As soon as I tell you that one goes here, that determines which group element. Okay. As soon as I tell you here, there's a particular motion of S3 that moves this point there. Okay. And so I'm talking about, when I put G there, I'm talking about the motion that moves the identity to there. When I put H there, I'm talking about the motion that moves the identity to there. OK? Um, these things are going to have metrics. There's going to be nice geodesics. There's going to be a shortest path from here to there. There's going to be a shortest path from here to there. And in fact, this will be parameterized by the reals. And so I could actually think of a point here as being T times G, where T is a real number. Okay? And I can imagine t times h, or s times h, where s is also a real number. And rather than considering the commutator of g and h, I could consider the commutator of t, g, and s, h. Okay? And as I go um, g, so I'm going to go g, h, g inverse, h inverse, and I'm going to end up somewhere close to the identity. And then I can try doing it with, with smaller values of T and S. And what I'm going to get is when I do the commutator of G and H, I'm going to get some point here. When I do the commutator of TG and TS, I'm going to get some point closer. And as T and S shrink, I'm going to get a sequence of points actually approaching the identity. Right? And so as I take the limit as T and S get small, it actually starts approaching the identity and I will approach the identity, um, let me say I make them both um, the same. As, I, as both of them go get small the same way, it actually approaches the identity along some particular tangent vector. OK? So um, this is some high dimensional nice manifold. At the identity, there's a tangent plane. There's a tangent plane. And you can end up looking at products like this, commutators. And look at what happens as I shrink G and H towards the identity and taking the commutator. And what's going to happen is that the Euclidean space, that's the tangent at the identity, is going to have an algebraic structure coming from this and a limiting process. And now I'm being vague, but I have to in order to get through the material. Okay? So Lie groups are manifolds that have a group structure. At the identity, when you take the commutator of elements close to the identity, you get something close to the identity. And you can take a limiting process as you come back along geodesics. And what you can do is you're going to be defining a product on the tangent space. Okay? This is good because we've gone from some complicated manifold to a, a, a nice vector space with a product. Okay? We've gone to a nice vector space with a product. And this is what's now called a Lie algebra. Okay? And so, so if you have a Lie group,
This is the algebra, you go to a Lie algebra, which is the algebraic structure on the tangent space at the identity element. So you go from some complicated curved manifold, like a sphere, and you now look at a tangent space, now you're down to some nice vector space with some algebraic structure. Okay? And so, so this Lee said, instead of classifying Lie groups, let's try classifying Lie algebras, because now we're doing linear algebra. This is much easier. All right? We've got nice linear algebra going on. Vector spaces with a product that has certain axioms. Okay, which I won't write down, but there's, there's a definition of Lie algebra. And then, inside the Lie algebra, what you can do is you try to find, you don't focus on the whole Lie algebra at once, you focus on a sub-algebra, a sub-vector space, where the product of any two things stays in that subspace. Okay? And in fact, what you want to do is you want to look at a subspace, a sub, yeah, let me go back to this picture. So actually, this product that we end up defining, it's really a product that we can view as a product of these two tangent vectors. Because if you give me a tangent vector and a tangent vector, from this tangent vector, I can think about the geodesic. With this tangent vector, I can think about the geodesic. And then I start looking at the commutators of those two elements as I come back in. And I declare that the, the vector that I approach on as the product of these two vectors. So now I take two tangent vectors and I get a third tangent vector. Okay? That's what I mean when I say that this is a vector space with a product. Okay? I know this is the, did you get the rough idea? The general idea? Yeah? Okay. All right. So you look at the algebraic structure on the tangent space of the identity. Then inside there, what if G and H commute? If G and H commute, this is zero. Which means that when we define this product, the tangent vector that gives me G, the tangent vector that gives me H, the product will be the zero vector. Right? And so if I had an abelian subgroup of my original Lie group, if I had a subgroup that was completely abelian, every two elements commute, then what's going to happen? Inside the Lie algebra, so if I had a subgroup that was abelian, then inside the Lie algebra, I'd have a sub subalgebra where all the products are zero. Okay? Because back in the group, they commute. And so all the commutators are zero. And so the, the induced product on the tangent space is zero. Okay? And so what you want to do is you want to look at a maximal abelian subalgebra. And what I mean by that, when I say abelian here, what I want is I want a subvector space so that the Lie bracket of the two, of any two vectors is zero. Meaning that they were abelian back here. Abelian here, product is zero here. Okay? Um, and then things get interesting because it turns out that, that the maximal abelian subalgebra that there's more than one inside the, the Lie algebra. So you've got a vector space. There might be some subspace here where everything's zero. There might be some other subspace where everything's zero. But it turns out that all of the maximal abelian subalgebras are conjugate to each other. That if you have this one and that one, then there's some element outside there that moves this one to that one. So they're all basically the same. There's essentially one up to this notion of conjugacy. Okay. But what does happen is that there are very particular elements inside the Lie algebra that conjugate this maximal abelian subalgebra not to something else, but actually to itself, setwise, not pointwise. And so the maximal abelian subalgebra is sent to itself possibly with a flip, or possibly rotated. Okay? 
And so when you look at how the, the Lie algebra, the, the, the stabilizer of the maximum abelian subalgebra inside the Lie algebra, there are actually elements that stabilize it set pointwise, fix it pointwise, and there are elements that move it around. Okay? I'm not proving any of this to you, I'm just asserting this as a fact. Okay? And what is interesting is that this maximum Bielian subalgebra, which is a vector space, right? It's a vector space with a trivial product, and we've now got something that's mapping it to itself. That turns out to be a discrete Euclidean reflection group. That the maps of this maximum Bielian subalgebra to itself the collection of, of maps turns out to be a discrete Euclidean reflection group. It's generated by reflections. It's discrete. And so in particular, it ends up being a Euclidean coxeter group. So um, the rough idea is that Lie groups are these very fundamental objects. They're groups that are manifolds. They occur everywhere, particularly in physics. Okay. Lots of times when you look at symmetries of, of, of mechanical systems, there's a continuous group of symmetries. It's a Lie group. Lie groups show up all over physics. In order to classify Lie groups, you look at the structure of the tangent space at the identity. That turns it into linear algebra. Much easier to analyze. Inside the linear algebra, you try and focus on the part that's the easiest to analyze, the stuff corresponding to abelian groups. And that gives you this maximum abelian subalgebra. And the that maximum Mendelian subalgebra has a discrete Euclidean reflection group acting on it. And it turns out that if you tell me the discrete Euclidean reflection group, there is a general procedure to reconstruct the maximum Mendelian subalgebra and the Lie algebra. And from the Lie algebra, reconstruct the Lie group. So as soon as you tell me the discrete Euclidean reflection group, I can build the Lie group. Okay? And so in order to classify Lie groups, it now turns into a question. I'm, I'm sweeping a few unpleasant details under the rug. Okay? There are some problems with the reconstruction, but it mostly works. Okay? In order to classify Lie groups, you try and classify discrete reflection groups, discrete Euclidean reflection groups. And once you've done that, you get the list that we had on the board yesterday. A n tilde, B n tilde, C n tilde, D n tilde, E6 tilde, E7 tilde, E8 tilde, F4 tilde, G2 tilde. Okay? And for each of those, you go back and you rebuild the Lie group. The group, and just to give you a couple of quick facts, the group A n tilde, the coxeter group A n tilde, goes back and ends up building the Lie group S L N. Okay, um, I should say a few extra things, but that's roughly true. Um, the Coxeter group, uh, C n tilde, ends up building what's called the symplectic group. Uh, the group B n tilde and D n tilde end up building the orthogonal groups. The groups of nice rigid transformations. Um, and so uh, this is SLN C um, SP 2 NC um, SO 2 NC SO 2 N plus 1 C. OK. And if this was a course on new groups, so these are sometimes called the classical groups. Um, this one you may or may not have heard of. This one is just um, in my end matrices with determinant one. This one is just the ones that preserve a nice um, standard dot product. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, that's just a, a rough picture, and I should be more careful if I wanted to give you the exact correspondence. But that's so. Those were Lie groups that were known. And these are the discrete reflection groups that they correspond to. So the infinite families end up corresponding to nice infinite families of, of known Lie groups. 
nice big invertible, nice big families of invertible matrices. What was a bit of a surprise was the E6, 7, and 8, F4, and G2. Um, you can go the work your way back and you get Lie groups that weren't known. You get new Lie groups. And in fact, those turn out to be very important in physics. The exceptional Lie groups. Okay. So that's actually about all that I want to say about Lie groups. Um, um, if this sounds interesting to you, I, I would suggest that you take a course in Lie groups that will give you all the precise details. Um, some of the things that I said are slightly wrong. Okay? But this is the big picture. That Lie groups lead to Lie algebras, lead to maximum Beer and side algebras, lead to discrete Euclidean reflection groups. And that once you have this, you can work your way back. Okay? Um, and because of the importance of Lie groups, that means these are important. And once they classify these, those names are used to describe the Lie groups. All right. So what I want to use the rest of the time today is I want to use, I want to put up some details about these different groups. So let's start with a summary. So let's start with the diagrams. Okay. And actually, let me introduce some terminology. These are called the Extended Incan diagrams. These are the diagrams that you've already seen. I'm just giving you the name for this class. So everything I'm putting up right now should be slightly familiar, but I'm going to do a, make a few modifications. And so since we know that every edge either has since we know that the only labels are 2, 3, 4, 6, and infinity, then we can simplify things. And so whenever there's a 4, I'm going to put two edges. Whenever there's a 6, I'm going to put three edges. OK? So, double edge, so this is a 4, that's a 4. OK? And it's called a double bond and a triple bond. And the thing that you should remember is that um, 4 cosine squared pi minus pi over 4 is equal to 2. And 4 cosine squared pi minus pi over 6 is equal to 3. And so the two edges and three edges actually reminds you of the 2 and 3 from before. And that if I put a 3 there, then it's a single bond. And so this is a nice. And so if I wanted to follow that pattern, I could put four edges here. OK? All right. Um, um, the other thing that I should highlight is that as I'm drawing these, I'm drawing one vertex slightly different from the others. Let me actually use a color.
I've got one vertex that's slightly different from the others. Okay, well, you probably can't see the last little bit. It just goes like this across and then, yeah, okay. All right, um, G2. Okay, so um, the, you'll recall that the number at the bottom tells you how many white vertices there are. The fact that there's a total on top means there's one extra vertex, and the one extra vertex is the one that makes it different from the F4 diagram, right? If you remove the orange dot, you see F4. If you remove the orange dot, you see G2. Move the orange dot, you see E6, E7, E8, BN, BN, CN. Okay. Um, uh, Dinkin is a Russian mathematician. Uh, he immigrated to the US. He's a professor at Cornell. He's actually still alive. And he's one of the first people that, that focused on these kinds of diagrams. And so they're named after him. And so they're called Dinkin diagrams. If you look at the ones for the finite, the spherical coxeter groups, those are Dinkin diagrams. The ones for the including coxeter groups are extended Dinkin diagrams because they have the one extra vertex. Okay. All right. There's actually extra things that I want to mark on these. And so let me go ahead and mark it, and then I'll tell you what they mean a little bit later. The thing that I want to mark is I want to mark, I want to put inequality signs. One is bigger than the other. And I want to say this dot, so whenever there's a, a double bond or a triple bond, I want to mark that one is, one is longer than the other. And I'll tell you why in a second. But for CN, the arrows point in. For BN, the arrow points the other way. That one doesn't have any double bonds. No double bonds, no double bonds, no double bonds. This one has a multiple bond, and it's going to point that way. This one has a multiple bond. And it's going to point that way. And there's actually a pattern that allows you to remember which way the arrow goes. Does anybody spot the pattern? There's a pattern. What's that? Um, let's see. Well, there's sort of whites on both sides, right? So yeah, actually, let me give you a hint. Look at the orange dot and the arrow. So you, the, the, um, the, if, you, if you think back for a second about what the dots mean, the dots represent vectors, right? Once we start talking about Euclidean things, we're going to actually not make these unit vectors. We're going to make some longer and some shorter, OK? And we're going to use the length of the vector to encode extra information, all right? If the two vectors are connected with an edge labeled 3, the reflection that this one determines and the reflection that this one determines both are in the same conjugacy class. 
because it turns out, just from the algebra, the two reflections are conjugate, which forces the two vectors to be the same length. Because of what, I haven't told you what we're going to use length to represent, but once you know what length represents, you'll see that the conjugate vectors better have, conjugate reflections better have the same length. Okay? And so, anything connected by a single edge, these two vectors have the same length. In fact, all of these vectors have the same length. Okay? How about here? Um, these vectors all have the same length. This one can have a different length. This one can have a different length. Here. These two can have different lengths, but all of these vectors have the same length. 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 Same length. Uh, these three have one length. These two have a different length. Okay? These two have one length. This one can have a different length. And the inequality tells you which vectors are long and which ones are short. There's only going to be two lengths. So these are long, those are short. Okay? These are long, that's short. All the same size, all the same size, all the same size, all the same size. Long, short. Okay? Long, short. All right, maybe now, now can you see the pattern with the orange dots? The orange dots are always long. The orange dots are always long, and if you actually just had the pictures without the inequalities, you can go back and fill them in now. The orange dots are always long. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, the next thing that I want to do is I want to actually uh, take this example and I want to draw the picture in some detail. Because what did we say the G2 tilde example was? That was a tiling of R2. Right? And it's a tiling of R2. What's the, what's, what's the basic shape? What's the triangle look like? Thirty, sixty, ninety. Right? It was sort of this triangle. Right? Pi over two, pi over three, pi over six. Right? That's the G two tilde triangle. Six, three, two. Pi over six, pi over three, pi over two. Yeah? Okay. So this is the the G two tilde tiling. Um, so what happens if I start reflecting in the sides? If I reflect in this side, I'm going to get an equilateral triangle. I could also reflect in this side. Get another equilateral triangle. Um, if I start reflecting around these two, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a subdivided hexagon. All right? And I'll continue on. Yeah? Let me actually try and draw that a little bit smaller. Let me start with the hexagonal tiling. That's probably good enough. And then now let me go ahead and just draw out all the subdivisions. And so on. Right? Okay, so this is going to be the tiling. And so when you think about, so let me go ahead and focus on one of these points where we have all the, so one point that I want to make is that there aren't that many slopes. 
that there are only six different types of lines. There's horizontal lines, there's vertical lines, pi over three, or flat, pi over six, pi over three, pi over two. There's six lines, right? Six, six different slopes. And there'll be parallel copies. There's like this line and there's this line, right? So there's six families. of parallel lines. There's this family, and then so on, right? Um, what I want to do is I want to record the root system. I want to record the normal vectors. And so for this family of lines, what I want to record is I want to record these two vectors. Okay? So for all the horizontal lines, I'll put these two vectors in my root system. Okay? And for this family of lines, I'm going to put these two vectors in my root system. But in order, so what I want is I want something, I want to write down a collection of vectors. I want to write down a collection of vectors that tells me all of the hyperplanes. That tells me all of the lines. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to record down, I'm going to record vectors that are perpendicular to the lines, and I'm going to use the length of the vector to tell me how far apart the lines are. Because if I look at two neighboring lines, the distance from this line to the next line is the same as this is from that line to the next line. They are equally spaced. Okay? They're nice and equally spaced, and that makes them easy to describe all at once. Because if I tell you how far it is from here to here, that tells you how far. Okay? Um, and But I want to do it in a slightly strange way. So if I, if I write down a vector alpha that's, that's vertical, um, let's say that this is the origin. Let's say that this is the origin. Then what's the equation? What's the equation of this line? The equation of this line for is alpha dot x equals zero, right? It's the stuff perpendicular to alpha, right? What I want to do is I want to pick alpha so that the next line is the equation alpha dot x equals one. By changing my length of alpha, I can make this to be the equation of this line. Right? Because if I say alpha dot x equals zero, then I get some line through the origin. If I say alpha dot x is some other constant, I'm going to get a parallel line. Right? And so all the different lines parallel to this will have some constant associated to them. I just want to pick the appropriate, I want to pick alpha so that this describes this line. Okay? Then what's the equation for this line? Alpha dot x equals 2. Alpha dot x equals 3. Alpha dot x equals 4. And so the lines the lines perpendicular to alpha are described by the equations alpha dot x lives in the integers. Okay? Zero is the line through the origin. One, two, three, four, one, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. And so pick the length of alpha so that it describes the very next line, that the, this equation describes the very next line. Okay?
Okay. So, um, let me talk about this a little bit. Um, what happens if I if I consider a short alpha and I consider a long alpha? The, the you need to think about how that affects the lines. But it, let me tell you what's true, and then you can think about it on your own. If I pick a very long alpha, the lines are closely spaced. If I pick a very short alpha, the lines are, are spaced far apart. And that's because if I pick a short alpha, to get the dot product to be 1, x needs to be long. Right? I mean, think of these, if you, if, you pick, if you look at your x, that's just a multiple of alpha. So you have alpha times a multiple of alpha. If this one's a small multiple of that direction, then this better be a big multiple in order for it to be equal to 1. If this is a big multiple, that better be a small multiple. Right? So long, out, long roots mean that they're close together. Short roots mean they're far apart. OK. All right. So. Um, what I want to do is I want to describe um, what I want to do is I want to describe the the root system. So when I look at the different directions, some of them are closely spaced, some of them are further apart. Like the distance from here to here is shorter than let's see, let's look at um, let's look at this one. Where is the next line parallel to this? Let me do this in color. Where is the next time I see a parallel line? Um, here. And so, yeah, that's a bigger distance than this. Right? That's a bigger distance than this. And so, this alpha, the alpha in this direction is going to be short. The alpha in this direction is going to be long. And so the root system, there's going to end up being 12 roots. Ignore this. This was just for, for helping me draw the picture. Those are the 12 roots. Those are the 12 roots. And so let me actually just very lightly draw um, what you should be seeing here. Is that if you if you if you look at a triangular tiling. You look at the Star of David and you look at these 12 points. Those are the vectors. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, so these 12 vectors, this is called the, this is the G2. And that's the notation. It's always phi. Phi, stand, phi is the letter that's used for the root system. And then you say which root system down below. Okay. So this is the root system, the G2 tilde, the G2 root system. And the fact that we didn't just use unit vectors, the fact that we actually used particular lengths, allows us to go back here, assume this is the origin, and now just write down all the equations root dot x equals an integer, 
and we get all the parallel reflections. With the length of the root telling us how how far how closely they're spaced. Okay. All right. So we're doing more encoding. So so what I what I'm wanting you to see is that with this information, you can reconstruct this picture. Right? That for each of the roots, you draw a hyperplane through the origin, and then by saying the root dot a point is equal to an integer, it allows you to get parallel families of roots, parallel families of lines. Okay? And so the equations alpha dot x equals integer, the equations alpha dot x equals integer for alpha in here describe all of the lines in the entire pattern. Okay? All right, we have two lengths of roots. We have some that are short, some that are long. And um, if you look at the lengths, let's say that the short ones are length one. So the short ones are unit vectors. That makes this a, a, an equilateral triangle length one. This is an equilateral triangle length one. What's this length? Square root three, right? And so this vector dotted with itself is three. And so, over on this picture, we have a short one and a long one. If the short one is 1, this one is square root 3. Okay? But if you have a triple bond, the ratio of the long to the short is square root 3. In this case, of double bond, if this is 1, this is square root 2. Okay? And so that's another meaning of the double and triple bonds. And single bond, same length. Single bond, same length. Double bond, 1 square root 2. <coughs> Triple bond, 1 square root 3. Okay? All right. Um, let's focus on... So, um, so this really is the... the um, I mean, if you look at just around the origin, what you see is you see this, the... the um, the symmetries of a hexagon, right? I mean, you see, you see a bunch of hyperplanes that break up. This is the subdivision of a hexagon. And so we could talk about a simple system. We could talk about picking, we could talk about taking the subdivided hexagon and we could talk about focusing in on a fundamental chamber like we did in the classification. If I focus on that fundamental chamber, then we could talk about the roots. There's that one corresponding to this. And there's this one corresponding to this. Right? Like we did in the classification. We've got our, we've got our fundamental chamber. We've got our fundamental chamber. It's got two hyperplanes. And we've got our two normal vectors. Okay? So there's this one and this one. And I'm going to go ahead and pick them with the appropriate length. So it's this one. And this one. What about this? The other, the final reflection. It's not through the origin. In fact, it's off here. And, but what it is, is it's the, it's the hyperplane not through the origin that is as close as possible. And because it's as close as possible, that means it's in a direction that has closely spaced hyperplanes. That means the alpha is as long as possible. And because this is as close as possible, that means that the root is as long as possible. Right? Which is why the orange dots are long. The orange dots are long because they represent a hyperplane that's as close as possible to the origin but not through the origin. Okay. So in this case, um, what I want to do is I could choose this one, but actually it's conventional to choose the, the opposite. And the reason for choosing this opposite one is that um, if I actually pointed, if I'm pointing towards it, I'm pointing towards it, I'm pointing towards it. And so 
I could have used pointing away, pointing away, and pointing away. But when I point towards the, the thing, then I get this is my third normal vector. And now if you, try, if you look at these three, um, all the angles are um, 90 degrees or more. All the angles are pi minus pi over m. And they are described by the diagram. And if you look at what we have, is we have a short vector, a long vector, and a long vector. And they're arranged like this. Short vector, long vector, long vector. Okay. All right. Um, I'm trying to use the G2 tilde tiling because you can actually see everything. It's two-dimensional. You can see the picture. And you can see how the spacing corresponds to the length and how a fundamental chamber corresponds to a selection of roots. And that the lengths actually tell you how far away to move things. Okay. All right. Great. So um, it's not as important in the low cases, but the, the lengths of the vectors become more crucial when you start talking about the bigger ones um, because we lose our ability to visualize. And so to describe the 30, 60, 90 triangle, to describe the 30, 60, 90 triangle, I want to record these three vectors. One short, two long. And those vectors with the angles, with the length information, is all encoded in this diagram with the special dot and the, and the inequality sign. Length one, length square root three, length square root three. Okay. All right. Let me leave that up for a second. Okay. What I want to do now is um, what I want to do now is um, is I want to actually talk about what the root systems look like in these other cases. The CN tilde root system. It's a collection of vectors, and it's a. Actually, let me start with. Let me start with BN. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do all of them. It doesn't matter which order I do them in. So let's do them. So. Do a big chart. I'm not going to do quite all of them, but let me just do some of the more important ones. And so Let's start with DN because it's the easiest to describe. The DN are all the vectors that have um, uh, EI is one of the basis vectors. And so it's like um, E1 plus E2, E1 minus E2, minus E1 plus E2, um, E3 minus E5, all of these vectors. And so if I was going to do in two dimensions, it's just in two dimensions, it's just these vectors. In three dimensions, what would it be? It would be um, over up, it would be pointing to the centers of the edges. Okay? And so there would be 12 vectors in this case, just pointing to the centers of the edges. Okay? And similarly, in, in D4, which is sort of the first interesting case, 
if you take a four-dimensional cube and you point to the centers of the Let's see. I'm going to go one, two. Yeah, so these are the centers of the one-dimensional faces out of three. When you're down here, it's the corners, you're the, the, the zero-dimensional faces out of two. And so when you're in a four cube, you should be pointing at the centers of the squares. Okay? The centers of the n minus two faces. They'll have lots of zeros and two non-zero terms. Okay? Um, but in any case, there'll be things like, um, so it'll be like one, one, bunch of zeros, uh, minus one, one, with a bunch of zeros, zero, one, zero, one, bunch of zeros, anything of this form, right? And so one way to write that would be plus or minus one, two of them, and then everything else, zero, and put them in whatever order you want. Okay? So two plus or minus ones, everything else zero, arranged however you want. That's the DM root system. Okay? That's the DM root system. In fact, let me go ahead and create some notation. And this is not standard notation. This is just something I like to use. And so, so phi n k is going to be out of your n dimensions, select k positions and make them plus or minus one. Okay? And so what's this? This is phi n two. Okay. Um, another so that's so so phi in two is set of plus or minus e i plus or minus e j. Oh, and what's the size of this? Let's see. If I didn't have the signs, it would be n choose two. But then I choose signs, right? And the size of phi and k, n choose k, 2 to the k, right? I select the positions, I select the signs. OK. Um, what's phi and 1? Yeah, it's just plus or minus e one. Right? Just the unit coordinate vectors. Just the unit coordinate vectors. All right. Does the notation make sense? Yep. Okay. Um, let me make a slight modification. What if I put a two in front of that? What would the natural thing be for that? Just multiply every vector by two. All right? Just rescale. Okay. Um, what's the length of this vector? These are unit vectors, right? What's the length of these vectors? The length of this vector? All of these vectors are 
square root 2. Right? All these vectors are length square root 2. And so when I write this, what do we have? We have long vectors, short vectors. Right? Long vectors, short vectors. And if you want to think in terms of the cube, so the, the phi ones are the unit coordinate vectors that corresponding to these hyperplanes. The phi two are corresponding to these hyperplanes, the ones that are cutting at diagonals, diagonals through the faces. Huh? And then the length of the two vectors are telling you how close or far apart the parallel families are. Okay. C. Almost the same. Only now what's happening? The length of these vectors, these are length square root 2. These are length 2. These are the long vectors. Those are the short vectors. And so in terms of the spacing, before one family was, was closely spaced and the other family was far apart. And when you switch from B to C, the other family is closely spaced and the other family is far apart. Okay? They describe slightly different shapes, slightly different tilings when you get to high dimensions. Um, then we get to some interesting ones. F4, am I doing all the time? Doing good. Okay, so here everything's in four dimensions, so I can actually be quite specific. Um, it's F42. Union 2, F41. So it kind of looks like C4 so far. Union F44. So F44, what would that look like? Plus or minus E1, plus or minus E2, plus or minus E3, plus or minus E4. Right? You have four choose four. You have all non-zero. All non-zero, each with a sign. So there are 16 vectors in this. Right? So the 16 corners of a four cube. Okay. What are the length, what's the length of that vector, of the vector in here? It's two, right? It's square root four. Its length is two. These are the same length. And so these are one length. This is a different length. Okay? All right. And then the last one. And um, this one is sort of interesting. Oops. We're in eight dimensions. So that's just like D8. And now this one I'm going to have to explain a little bit but it's not going to be too bad. That would be fine. That you would understand. That you would also understand. But now I'm going to put even. So this is a slight modification. What I mean by even is that when you, so what is um, phi 8, 8? All eight positions are non-zero with a plus or a minus sign. This says that you only want the ones with an even number of minus signs. Okay? And so the number of minus signs has to be even. Okay, so only so it's not all of phi 8, 8, it's half of phi 8, 8, and then they're rescaled. And so what's the length of these vectors? The length of these vectors is square root 8, or 2 square root 2. The length of these vectors, square root 2. Square root 2, all the same length. OK? And, if, and how many of these are there? Well, this is 8 choose 2. Right? This is 8 choose 2 times 2 squared. Right? 8 choose 2, so it's 8 times 7 divided by 2 times 2 times 2, so 56 times 2, 100 
No, 112. 112, right? Okay, so these are 112. Um, here, we just choose eight signs. So that's two to the eight. That's whatever two to the eight is. Two to the eight is 256. But then we want it to be even. So 128. And so there's 128 of those. Right? And so we end up getting 240. Okay. Oh no, it does. Get, it comes from an Euclidean tiling. Yeah, it just doesn't come from a regular polytope. Yeah, and so if you use if you use these vectors, if you if you can find vectors with these angles, and you go ahead and make the white ones describe hyperplanes through the origin, and then you have the orange one be the appropriate direction but off the origin and use those reflections. That describes a simplicial shape, and reflecting the other sides tells a dimensional space. It is an Euclidean tiling with a simplicial fundamental domain. And this is describing the shape of the basic simplex. Okay? Yeah, and the lengths tell you that they're all equally spaced. Um, all right. Uh, one thing that... Um, One thing that might be interesting for you, and I want to leave this as an exercise. One thing that might be interesting for you is to do the following. Find roots with the correct angles In other words, um, so let me, let me actually say this more precisely. So we know that the DN root system looks like this, right? So inside that DN root system, you should be able to find roots with these angles, right? You should be able to find roots with these angles. And so for example, let me just get you started on this one. So maybe this one is e1 plus e2. Then maybe this one is e2 minus, or e3 minus e2. Because when you look at the dot product, the dot product is going to be negative 1. And if you actually calculate the angle, that turns out to be the right angle. OK? Because this is length 2, square root 2. This is length square root 2. In order for this to be a, a 2 pi over 3 angle, pi minus pi over 3, the dot product ends up needing to be minus 1. And so these have the correct angle. These also have the correct angle. And these are perpendicular. OK? And then over here, you can do something like um, e4 minus e3. That's going to be perpendicular to that, perpendicular to that, and have a 2 pi over 3 angle with this. Okay, and so far everything I've drawn is inside here. Okay. Can you ex can you go all the way across? Can you build? Can you find roots of this pattern inside here? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you might want to come. Up, yeah. So. Uh, try that. Try that tonight, and we'll talk about it again tomorrow. Um, and for as many as you can, I've given you explicit root systems. Now the question is, can you find actual roots that have these patterns? Okay. Can you find actual roots that have these patterns? Um, and if you want, an so find roots with the correct patterns. And the second part of this is. Um, Find the linear dependency. Because once you find these, these roots, this is n plus 1 vectors in Rn. And we know they're linearly dependent. 
right? If you find something with those angles, you're going to find vectors that are linearly dependent. Find the linear dependency. Turns out there's an essentially unique linear dependency among the roots. And you'll notice some very interesting things. The linear dependency will have integer coefficients. There'll be one of those, two of those, two of those, four, five of those. Your integer coefficients will add up to zero. Okay? The linear, the linear dependency will have integer coefficients. And in fact, they will have positive integer coefficients. And those numbers will be sort of interesting. We'll come back and talk about them. Okay? But this actually, now you've got explicit roots, explicit vectors, patterns that you want to find. So find vectors with these patterns, and then find the linear dependency. This is sort of a good hands-on exercise. Yeah? All right. I still have a couple minutes, but I'll let you go early today. All right? Okay. Thanks.